Hello, I'm Hugh Sampson. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. And I've been asked today to talk about diagnosing and monitoring food allergy with ex vivo humoral response assessment. Before I start, I would like to give my disclosures. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm a faculty member part-time at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. I'm also chief scientific officer at DBV Technologies, a company developing an epicutaneous patch for treating peanut allergy. Uh, I also serve on a couple consulting boards for startup companies looking at therapeutics. I receive grants from the NIH and some royalties for textbooks from Elsevier. Um, I also want to note that uh, Mount Sinai has licensed the Epitope uh, platform to a startup company named Allergenis for commercialization. And I do serve as an unpaid member of the board of directors of Allergenis. Now, looking at IgE specific antibodies, uh, especially for food allergens, this was a paper that first introduced the concept back in 1967, 53 years ago, when Weed, Benich, and Johansson published this in The Lancet. This was the first description of the radioallergosorbent test, or RAST as it was known, and they coupled 14 different allergens, the only food allergen being shellfish, to cephidic speeds and used I-25 labeled anti-IgND. Uh, this was before people had actually settled on the term IgE antibody. And what they were able to do was demonstrate specificity and predictability of this assay when compared to provocation to the various allergens. Uh, from the 1970s to the 1990s, there was improvement in this particular technique. This was largely done by a company in Sweden, Pharmacia, who developed the Fetibus RAST, which provided a semi-quantitative measurement of allergen-specific IgE. The measurement was reported in something called PRUs, or Pharmacia RAST units, and also given a class description uh, from undetectable to uh, up to four. Other companies over this period of time also developed various assays using a radio immunoassay or an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. In the 1990s, Pharmacia then introduced a new system, which we use today called Immunocap. And this is a high throughput automated assay using a, a new solid phase, which actually allowed a greater absorption of antigen. It was calibrated against the WHO standard IgE antibody. This assay was reported out in kilo units uh, per liter and led to an expanded class system because of its increased sensitivity and range. And the diagram on the right shows you the range that this particular uh, system had, which extended beyond what the RAST had at both ends, and also compares the class system, which many people still consider today, and how it correlates with the IgE measurement in kilounits per liter. 2001, we first reported uh, the utilization of this quantitative assay for predicting the likelihood of people reacting to specific foods. And as you can see here, we were reported on egg, cow's milk, peanut, and fish. What we were able to do with this system is show that if you exceeded a certain level, so in this example with egg, if you exceeded seven kilounits per liter based on the outcome of both a retrospective and prospective study as indicated by the purple and green line, you could say that in, that individual would have a 95% likelihood of reacting to egg. If the level was lower, such as 3.5, it's down to 80%, 1.2, down to 50%, and so forth. And then over the next several years, uh, these decision points uh, were expanded to other foods and also took into account differences in age. So for example, a child less than two years of age with a egg-specific Ig of two kilounits per liter would be at the 95% likelihood of reacting. So this uh, quantitation of food-specific IgE was shown to correlate well with the probability of an allergic reaction, meaning that if someone ingested a food, it was 95% likely they would react. These levels do not correlate with the severity of reaction a person might experience or that patient's sensitivity 
or the amount of uh, particular allergen that would lead to uh, allergic symptoms or the eliciting dose. Now, one of the things that was pointed out uh, by Perry and coworkers at uh, Johns Hopkins was the importance of maintaining uh, a good history whenever using these particular tests. And what they did was evaluate 169 children with suspected food out peanut allergy, uh, dividing them into two groups. Uh, group one had a history of a past reaction to peanut. Group two were individuals avoiding peanut without a history of past reaction, but evidence of IgE at one point to peanut. What they were able to show was that if you took the first group where you combined history plus the value of 0.36 to less than two kilounits, the vast majority of patients who had a no history of reacting were likely to pass the test. 71% passing the oral food challenge compared to only 44% with a past history. And if you look at levels of greater than five with a positive history, none of those children uh, passed the oral food challenge, whereas three quarters of those with no history did pass. So past medical history is very important uh, consideration when using these various tests. Now, the other thing that uh, it was shown over uh, the last several years was that these quantitative measurements followed over time could be used to help monitor when a patient might be able to tolerate a specific food. What was shown was that if a young child, now uh, this would be a, somebody less than five, had a drop to a level of egg-specific IgE of 1.5 kilounits, there was a good probability that that child would have outgrown their egg allergy and would be able to ingest it. And then values for milk and peanut were also determined. So they can be useful uh, to give you a better idea of whether or not uh, it's worth performing a oral food challenge to see if the patient has now become tolerant. Over the last 10 years or so, uh, we've had the, a number of components of various foods become available for testing. And the advantage of this is that by identifying the specific allergens within a, a food, such as peanut, and now we know that uh, there are several RH1, 2, 3, and 6 that are highly relevant to whether or not a patient will experience systemic symptoms, and separating those from other cross-reacting allergens uh, with peanuts, such as RH8, which cross-reacts with uh, BETV1 and birch pollen, that we can be much more specific about those who will react to the, the particular food, in this case, peanut. So there are a variety of these now available, uh, more so in, in the area of, of tree nuts, but peanut, hazelnut, soy, and wheat, for example. And what we know is that these pollen cross-reacting antibodies potentially uh, initiate symptoms in the mouth or the oral allergy syndrome, such as itchy mouth, tingly tongue, possibly some tightness in the throat, but don't generally induce a systemic reaction. Whereas other uh, components in peanuts, such as RH2, RH6, uh, hazelnut, CORI-9, CORI-14, soy, glyam 8 or in wheat, the TRI-A19 or omega-5 gliadin are much more likely to indicate that this patient would experience systemic symptoms or possibly anaphylaxis. Now, looking at uh, various decision points that have been developed over the years for these various components, it's been shown in a number of studies that if an individual has a RH2 or RH6 value greater than two, two kilounits per liter, it's highly likely that this individual would experience a reaction uh, if peanut was ingested. With hazelnut, CORE-9 or CORE-14 levels greater than two, or five kilounits are also highly diagnostic that this individual would experience uh, a reaction to hazelnut. We've seen many patients in the clinic with very high levels to core A1, the bet B1 or birch pollen uh, major protein with levels of core A1 in excess of 100 who can still ingest hazelnuts without any systemic symptoms. Uh, with cashew, in pistachio, it's been shown that the component NO3 that has a level greater than 0.35 is highly diagnostic. When we look at some of the other proteins, such as soy, glyam 8, uh, greater than 5 kilounits is relatively diagnostic, and tri A19 or the omega 5 gliadin group uh, greater than 2 is moderately diagnostic for wheat allergy. So these will give us a little bit more specificity 
to the diagnosis. But again, knowing the, the clinical history is very important. Now, more recently, uh, we've moved not only from specific allergen component proteins, but now looking at specific epitopes that are on those particular proteins. We started looking at this uh, actually over 20 years ago when we were mapping where on a particular protein the IgE antibody actually bound. And this is ovomucoid, uh, the first protein we looked at, trying to ascertain where IgE attached. This was done by setting up a series of overlapping uh, peptides uh, and then identifying where on that particular protein uh, these IgE antibodies bound. And as indicated here, there were five locations where IgE was bound. We then got into microassays where we were able to look at individual patients instead of using large serum pools. What we found was that the majority of children actually didn't bind to these peptides and we were somewhat puzzled with this. So we used a technique uh, called native gel electrophoresis where we could run the whole protein. We could reduce and alkylate the protein, meaning we would stretch it out so that it would be linear as you would run in an SDS gel and then also deglycosylated it. And what we found was the majority of children actually uh, reacted only uh, to the native um, ovomucoid. And those children who had the persistent form, which was really the 20% or so that had persistent, persistent form, had antibodies that recognized the linearized form or these epitopes. Uh, so this was the first indication that we had that there was a difference in the type of epitope patients bound. Those with the transient form of egg allergy bound to conformational epitopes or epitopes where the amino acids come into proximity because of the shape of the protein, as opposed to sequential epitopes, meaning this, that the amino acids are in sequence along the backbone of the protein. This also then led to the concept that those individuals who have the transient form of allergy, who can't tolerate milk in the regular form, uh, should be able to, in fact, tolerate it if it's baked, where you heat to nature uh, the milk protein. And this was uh, found to be true in subsequent study. Also, similar findings were published for egg allergy. More recently, we've been able to develop a bead-based epitope assay uh, where we look at the specific epitopes, so the linear sequences uh, in along the backbone of the protein, and bind those to Luminex beads. These are then placed into a 96-well plate, patient serum is put in, there's a detection antibody for either IgE or IgG4, that's then incubated, washed, and then read on a multiplex Luminex spectrometer. And we come out with different fluorescent intensities to these various epitopes that reflect the concentration of antibody that binds to these particular beads, much as what you would see in ELISA assays. And what we end up with is a map of binding to all the different epitopes uh, that are in these particular uh, proteins. So this now is, is just looking at uh, mapping of individual peptides uh, created by, which are then useful in identifying a patient's profile of binding to the different epitopes. The columns here would represent a separate peptide or uh, sequential epitope, and the y-axis here represents individual patients. And it's fairly clear to see with the red representing high fluorescence, the blue representing low fluorescence, that you can characterize these patients into uh, alert, those who are allergic and those who are non-allergic fairly distinctly as indicated here. So the, one of the first studies we did was in uh, collaboration with Dr. Sackison from Turkey who had studied a group of children there who were milk allergic and did challenges to different forms of food to see uh, whether or not they would uh, react to the different forms. So they started off with uh, 89 children who were first uh, challenged to baked milk product. They found out of this group of 89 that uh, 16 of those children reacted to baked milk. 
uh, and therefore no further challenges were done in this group. They then uh, took the group that didn't respond to the baked milk, challenged those to fermented milk, which is in the form of a, a yogurt or a cheese, and found that of that group, 18 reacted to the fermented milk product. Uh, so no further challenges were done with these. In the group that didn't react, they were then challenged with whole milk, regular milk to determine whether or not they were actually still sensitive to milk. They found that 23 of these children did in fact react to whole milk, whereas 32 had already outgrown it. So we then used this uh, bead-based uh, epitope assay, looking at IgE and IgG4 uh, antibodies to specific epitopes in five major allergenic uh, component proteins of cow's milk. We wanted to determine whether the uh, by using this epitope analysis, we could identify profiles which would break these children down into the individual groups without actually having to do the oral food challenge. So this is now showing you uh, a heat map of all these patients. These are the different uh, proteins in cow's milk that were looked at. We had previously identified uh, term informative epitopes in these different proteins each column representing a different patient. And you can get the general sense, the upper portion being IgE, lower being IgG4, that there are uh, significant differences in these groups of children with respect to their binding profiles. And here you can, uh, is just a summation of the binding to the uh, different epitopes showing that those who react to the baked milk have by far the highest level of IgE binding or IgG4 binding to those specific uh, epitopes. And overall, what we see is that those children who react to baked milk have these higher levels than those children who react to fermented milk versus those who react only to whole cow's milk. And then comparing the epitope test, what we see is the model that includes the IgE binding peptides or the informative epitopes could accurately identify each of these classes or phenotypes of patients uh, with about greater than 86% of the time. So showing fairly high uh, sensitivity and specificity with an area under the curve of 0.89. If you combine both IgE, the most informative IgE and IgG4, the accuracy dips slightly, although the uh, sensitivity and specificity was slightly greater. But what this does indicate is that using these epitope profiles, we can actually break these phenotypes down uh, with better than 85% predictability. Now, we also looked at uh, whether or not these allergenic epitope profiles could predict the outcome of uh, treatment with oral immunotherapy. And this is a, a study that was performed with uh, Bob Wood uh, from Johns Hopkins, where we looked at the use of omelizumab in a randomized controlled trial of or oral immunotherapy for cow's milk. And here, 57 patients were randomized, half receiving omelizumab, half getting placebo, and then after four months being started on oral immunotherapy. And what we were looking at was whether or not there was differences in adverse reactions uh, and whether or not they had prolonged sustained unresponsiveness or a more general tolerance. So what we did in the end, there were 47 patients uh, who were evaluable, 21 were desensitized, but did not have sustained unresponsiveness, 23 had sustained unresponsiveness, three were non-responders. We also had, all tests were done in uh, replicates and we had negative controls. Using the 15 most informative epitopes is determined by a machine learning algorithm, we were able to show very distinct specifically which children were likely to attain sustained unresponsiveness out of this group versus those that weren't. And using the algorithm, we actually can train it so that the area under curve is one, meaning it's essentially perfect. However, these machine learning protocols need to be validated because they're set up to give you the best reading out of your initial test group. And when you do the cross-validation, you see here that the accuracy was not uh, quite as good. It was about 80% as opposed to with the test group. And this is true basically in all kinds of assays that we do. We then looked at another model uh, using the five most informative epitopes. And these just show what, what those were. And here we see that we can achieve 
an accuracy of uh, 84% with these five epitopes, sensitivity and specificity both being above 80%, area under the curve uh, being slightly less. But overall, suggesting that at the initiation of therapy, identifying the specific profile, epitope profiles that these patients have, we could determine fairly accurately whether or not they would be likely to achieve uh, sustained unresponsiveness following oral immunotherapy. And then finally, uh, in one study uh, using a cohort from our COFAR natural history study, we wanted to determine whether we could more accurately predict which young infants would go on to develop peanut allergy uh, out of a high-risk population that was looked at. Now, in the COFAR study, the patients were uh, ended up being divided into what we called serologic positives, or those children who ended up with peanut-specific IgE greater than 14 kilounits per liter at about four to five years of age versus confirmed, which were children who had an oral food challenge or a highly convincing history plus uh, serologic values indicating positivity to peanut. And this could be either with a skin test or uh, serum IgE level versus non-allergic children who were those who were sensitized meaning they had evidence of Ig antibody, but could eat the peanut with no problem, or they weren't sensitized and they were tolerant that they were actually eating it. Uh, these children had three visits. This is the breakdown at each visit. Uh, first at year one, which was four to 11 months, visit two at about two years, and then visit five at about four years. And this is the breakdown of numbers of children who are either non-allergic or considered allergic based on serology or uh, confirmed diagnosis. Uh, looking then at uh, 50 epitopes overall, 50 specific epitopes in RH1, 2, and 3, which were found previously by machine learning to be the most uh, informative, we see that over time, all the children uh, who ended up with being allergic had uh, significant increases in their epitope pro profiles as, as shown by these z-scores, both for IgE and IgG4. So clear differences between the allergic and non-allergic children across all visits. The question was though, could we identify these children very early on before two years of age uh, when many people feel that intervention might actually be more effective in generating full tolerance as suggested by uh, the LEAP trial performed by Dr. Lack and his colleagues. Uh, in order to do this, uh, we also wanted to look at peanut-specific IgE and component-specific IgE to see if they would add more to the predictability in this very young age. And what we saw when we looked at the IgE epitopes was that at the initial diagnosis, looking at the informative IgE epitopes only, we had about 88% uh, predictability. But if we looked at that, plus the use of peanut-specific IgE, we could get the uh, predictability or the area under the curve up to about 0.98. So considerably higher than uh, using, in this case, the Ig epitope alone. When we get up to two years of age, both are comparable, similar at 5a. So the area under the curve at two and five were about the same, whether we included peanut-specific IgE but it seemed very important at that very first visit, four to 11 months of age, that we also include peanut. We then, uh, in looking at this, wanted to see what, which combination uh, would give us the, the best information. So we looked at epitopes alone. This could be IgE, IgG4, epitopes plus the peanut-specific IgE, or epitopes plus component-specific IgE. Looking at that, um, we used Ig antibodies to epitopes alone and showed that they were able to accurately diagnose peanut allergy in the majority of patients. And this figure just gives you the breakdown of these uh, different combinations at the different time points. Purple being those where we used epitopes alone, uh, green being where we used epitope plus the peanut specific IgE, and then uh, the yellow being the immunocap or the component proteins and peanut protein alone. And we see again here that combining peanut-specific IgE with the epitope models in cross-validation, so this is not the testing, but the cross-validation 
we can predict with 95% accuracy where that patient will be. And this is indicated uh, here uh, with, with the green line. So suggesting that at a very early age, we can uh, identify which high-risk children are likely to end up with peanut allergy. So in conclusion, uh, using these various profiles of IgE binding antibodies to the sequential allergenic epitopes of food allergens uh, does correlate very well with clinical phenotype. That the diversity of IgE binding to these sequential allergenic epitopes uh, also has been shown to correlate with severity of clinical reactions. I haven't shown you this data, but this is in uh, two, two different published papers that the algorithms we utilize uh, utilizing these different IgE binding antibodies to sequential epitopes may be used to actually monitor and predict the outcome of immunotherapy for various food allergies. And then also the algorithms utilizing IgE binding to these sequential allergenic epitopes may be used to identify infants who will develop a persistent form of peanut allergy, thus allowing us to intervene at a very early age. Similarly, we've had a chance to look at the LEAP uh, cohort and found uh, very similar findings in that cohort as well, showing that the use of the Ig epitopes plus a peanut-specific IgE gives us very high predictability of which children will uh, develop peanut allergy. So I just want to acknowledge my colleagues uh, that have worked with us doing the uh, different uh, epitope analyses, and thank you all for your attention.